Hi guys, Buildzoid here, and we're back with the 4x16 DDR5 uh, t like overclocking and testing. This time on an Asus uh, Strix B660-F gaming board. Uh, provided by a The motherboard was provided by Asus, so big thank you to them for sending it over for testing. Um, and uh, the memory kit is some Corsair 6200 megabits per second CL36 uh, SK Hynix based single rank DDR5. 16 gig DIMMs, of course, which I said at the start. So, oh, and the CPU I'm using is a 12900K, and it's being cooled by a 240 millimeter AIO, which is unfortunately inadequate for this setup because on the B660 motherboard, they're like, I did. I probably could have put more time into fixing some of the CPU performance issues that I'm having, but uh, let's just, like, the thing is, B660 removes a lot of the stuff that you have on Z690. Um, so, yeah, that, the, well, well, we'll see. Well, let's just get to it. Let's just take a look at the overclock. So, um, as far as the board is concerned with memory overclocking, it is just as good as the Maxima Z690 formula is, as far as I can tell. Uh, so, yeah, the settings it's running are literal. well, they're actually slightly better than what I was running on the formula, because I figured out that you can actually run the tertiary timings a bit tighter than what I had on the formula, but other than that, it's literally the same settings. 6,000 megabits per second, CL32, and we're gonna go all, go through all of the sub-timings, uh, later, but, yeah, so, like, the board does the exact same settings that the formula does, so... Uh, apparently Asus really has, you know, 4x16 DDR5 setups, like, really figured out for, for their Z690 boards, and it doesn't seem to matter if you have a 6-layer daisy chain or an 8-layer daisy chain topology, uh, which is really cool, because, like, this board costs, I think, like, a third of what the formula does, and it runs the same settings. So, yeah, like, you're not, like, I can't complain about that now, can I? Um, so... Yeah, anyway, now in terms of performance, uh, this is slower than the formula, but that's not because of the memory overclocking, that's because of the CPU. So, Linpack, as you can see, is getting around 600 gigaflop. well, six, the thing is, Linpack is thermal throttling, just constantly, because on B660, uh, you can't really change the core voltage very much without running into some very strange CPU behavior that I'll, I'll make another video about that. But basically, uh, the stock voltage frequency curve for a 12900K is awful, especially on my 12900K. Like, my 12900K is bad, really bad. Um, and the stock voltage frequency curve on it is atrocious. And so running at 4.9 gigahertz in Linpack, it is constantly thermal throttling because... Intel's stock voltage specification is way too generous, um, and it runs way too damn hot, consequently. And you might be like, oh, why don't you just undervolt it? Well, I tried that, and then it, like, clock stretches. So, Linpack ends up running at, like, a third of the, per like, third, of, well, half the speed it should run at, so... Uh, yeah, so basically the, the Linpack performance here is a result of me trying to balance the thermal throttling versus the clock stretching that happens if you lower the voltage too much, and this is what I ended up with. Realistically, with these memory settings at 4.9 gigahertz, we should be seeing consistently over 600 gigaflops, but yeah, I can't, I can't do anything. Well, I could put more cooling on the CPU, but without doing something like that, I can't get Linpack to run any better because this is a B660 board and Intel doesn't let you play with all of the settings that are necessary to fix that. So, um, yeah, anyway, other than that, Memtest ran out, you know, I ran Memtest of 500%, so Memtest is perfectly happy. Uh, I saw a comment under the previous video with a uh, previous DDR5 overclocking video where somebody said that apparently the 7-zip benchmark is, like, really hard for them to pass. So here's a thousand passes of 7-zip. I, I kind of feel like this is similar to Linpack in terms of what it does, because it doesn't use a lot of RAM. Um, but I guess since it's, like, compressing and decompressing stuff, it puts some load on the CPU. But, yeah, it's really no problem to, to run that uh, for me. So that ran. Uh, if we look at IDA, you'll notice that the IDA latency is worse than what I was getting on the Maximus Formula uh, on the Z690 setup, and that's very simply because on the Z690 setup, the CPU was running faster. Uh, like, yeah, like, it, more uncore clock, 
also more consistently like technically the cpu has that 5.1 gigahertz boost but or actually isn't it even 5.3 i don't remember it the thing is the cpu doesn't reliably stick to a frequency and so the latency is actually worse when the cpu is managing its own clock speed um actually every like every basically everything is worse when the cpu is managing its own clock speed um Oh yeah, so the latency is uh, just worse than what, what the formula was getting by a couple nanoseconds, and that's just because I can't lock in the CPU frequencies, which is rather annoying, but, you know, it's B660, so um, that's that's kind of like, yeah, B660 things. Um, the 7-zip performance actually seems really high. Um, now, I've not used this as a benchmark in the past, so I don't actually know that, like, I'm not sure how it's supposed to compare against other setups, but as far as I can tell, having 117 giga instructions per second uh, for uh, compression and then 107 for decompression is seems to be pretty fast um, from the limit, like the little information I could find about this benchmark on the internet. Um, so yeah, that's kind of that. Like the the board, like if it weren't for the fact that it's a B660 board. Everything would be, like, it would literally match the, the Z690 formula for everything, but as it is, there's just a bunch of CPU stuff that I've, like, this board actually m might, it might be possible on this board to work around a lot of the restrictions that Intel has on, like, messing with the CPU, but I've just not put time into that, because my priority was seeing, like, hey, is the board good at memory over, like, is the board good at memory overclocking, and is, more importantly, is the board... Uh, does, does the board play well with a 4x16 DDR5 setup? And the answer to that is yes. Yes, it does. It, it does just as well as the formula does, and the formula is, like, the one out of the boards I've tested, the formula is the best in 4x16. Uh, this matches that, so, yeah, it's tied for first place with the formula when it comes to 4x16 memory support. And, yeah, I'm very impressed by that, because this board is, like, a third of the price of the formula. So, that's pretty cool. Um... And I guess at this point, let's just go look at the BIOS settings. Um, so, yeah, because it passes all of the stress tests. Um, this, like, there's not much else uh, to get into. Also, while well, we're not going to run Geekbench, because it scores, like, for any, any memory benchmark that I can run on this, it'll score very slightly lower than the formula, because I can't lock the CPU speed. Um, so... Yeah, anyway, let's restart and go into the BIOS. Now, the biggest annoyance with memory overclocking on this board is that it does not have a postcode. So when... And the reason that's an annoyance is when you're running 4x16, uh, the board takes a while to train the memory. Um, and so you end up just having the yellow LED glowing, and it's like, well, did it lock up or is it training? Who knows? Because that LED stays on forever. Um, but... Um, yeah, like, you just have to sort of get used to having to wait for it to get through memory training. So, anyway, let's go through the settings. So, I have uh, the board set to XMP2, which just means that it loads the XMP profile from the memory sticks and doesn't load any, like, adjustments by ASUS. Um, we have the gear, uh, CPUs in gear 2. This is one thing that I don't get, why there's a lot of DDR5 boards that give you the option to try set gear 1, because it doesn't work. As far as I can tell, the DDR5 portion of the memory controller doesn't support uh, gear 1 at all. But yeah, anyway, so the memory like the memory to DRAM uh, frequency is set to 1 to 2, so that's gear 2. Um, DRAM frequency itself is at 6, uh, well... That's not supposed to be labeled frequency. It should be labeled data rate, but uh, that's at 6,000 megabits per second or 3,000 megahertz because, you know, double data rate. Um, that's that's why it's wrong to call that megahertz. But anyway, um, down here, uh, actually, we're not going to get into the memory timings just yet. So, yeah, I have a very slight negative offset to try get Linpack to not thermal throttle like crazy, but it's not enough. Uh, VCCSA is at 1.1. This is perfectly fine for long-term use. VC, uh, input voltage, I have that at 2 volts, which is also perfectly fine for long-term use. Can help a little bit with stabilizing memory overclocks, because the VCC in voltage is primarily used for, uh, powering things like the system agent and, uh, the VDDQ rail, which, uh, I don't actually know what exactly the VDDQ, like, the internal CPU VDDQ rail is. 
I know there's another VDDQ rail over here, but that one's on the memory stick and handled by the memory stick has nothing to do with VCC in. Um, anyway, so we have DRAM VDD voltage, which is at 1.4, DRAM VDDQ also at 1.4. Um, these are perfect, like this is, I'd say on the low side for what you can run on DDR5 um, right now. So yeah, this is perfectly safe for long-term use. If you push more voltage into the memory, you could probably lower your primary timings a bit, but it's not gonna make a huge difference to performance. Um, anyway, for advanced voltages, I have IVR transmitter VDDQ set to 1.4 volts. Uh, with ASUS boards, you basically have to set this to match your DRAM VDD and VDDQ voltages, as for whatever reason that works best. Uh, best. On uh, pretty much any other manufacturer, you can set that to 1.35 volts and forget about it. Um, so yeah, that that's just like a weird quirk of like how ASUS boards do something. I, I have no idea why this, why they have this behavior. Like. Initially, I would have thought like they switched the voltage names around, but now this this is just like a Asus motherboard thing, and this is actually VDD2, which I have set to 1.296 volts. Um, and uh, yeah, that's also perfectly safe for long-term use. And then everything else in here, I didn't actually change. The board just sets these three on its own. So that's what's going on with that. Um, anyway, if we go to Tweaker's Paradise, um, I've also set the memory controller PLL and the ring PLL to, uh, well, so ring PLL is at 0.96 because this CPU's ring uh, just likes a little bit more ring PLL voltage. And the memory controller is at 1.05 because that can help with memory overclocking sometimes. I don't actually think it's necessary at the 6,000 megabits per second, but it doesn't hurt anything, so why not? Right. So yeah, that's, that's my approach to a lot of the voltages is like, this might be higher than it absolutely needs to be. But if it doesn't, like if it's not dangerous for the health of the, to the health of the CPU and it's not harming the stability, why not? Cause like, you know, I, I'd rather have settings that I know work and just be able to use them consistently without worrying about like, Hey, is, is there a difference this time? So, um, yeah, anyway, now let's get into the timings. So for primaries, we've got 32, 38, 38, 28. This isn't... There are definitely SK Hynix memory chip-based memory sticks that can go lower than this. Um, and also, it depends on how much voltage you're shoving into them, right? At 1.4 volts, I think this is a, this is probably pretty close to the limit of what these DIMMs can do. Um, but also, like, going from CL32 to CL30 doesn't make that much of a difference. So that's... Kind of part of why this is set up, set up the way it is. Uh, command rate is a 2N because 1N does not work in dual rank yet. Um, or, well, I don't know if I should say yet because I don't actually know if it's possible for 1N command rate to function in dual rank DDR5 setups. It, it's perfectly possible that it'll never work. Um, un, or until, like, it won't work until we get better memory controllers with, like, 13th gen or maybe Ryzen or, or something like that. But for now, 1N does not work. 2N is necessary, pretty much. Um, anyway, then we have RAS to RAS delay long, which I have at six. Arguably, it would probably, like, it would probably work at four, but in some scenarios, uh, it might not. And so it's easier to just go with six, four. Like, the performance difference is minimal because on DDR5, you have eight bank groups per rank. So the long delay is not very, like, that, the, the long delay timing doesn't get used very often compared to the short delay. And the short delay is as short as it can be. It doesn't go below four. The memory controller doesn't support lower settings than that. Uh, refresh cycle is 333. It can go lower than that, but it, again, it doesn't make that much of a difference going below, like, going to 300 or something is not going to drastically change the memory performance. And if you push the refresh timings uh, too far on DDR5, you can actually start running into weird performance issues as you're going to start hammering the built-in uh, on-die error correction, which is there specifically to prevent data loss, which is what uh, you sort of start running into as you push your refresh timings too far. Because um, the whole point of the refresh timings is to make sure that data stays stored in the memory. Uh, so if you don't refresh often enough or don't give the RAM enough time to refresh, uh, your data starts going bye-bye, and then the ECC starts trying to fix that, and then you get problems. So, yeah. Don't, like, so, I have, like, I prefer punching values that I know are for sure safe, 
rather than trying to get those to the limits of what they're capable of doing. Um, similar to is similar is true for the 65,000 TREFI. You can set it way higher, but I have occasionally seen weird behavior with it maxed out. So I prefer running it at 65,000 where I've not run into any issues whatsoever. It's also worth noting that refresh interval on like auto settings for DDR5 is like 6,000 cycles, which is super, super short. Right, like so, going from six thousand, uh, a refresh interval of six thousand to a refresh interval of sixty-five thousand, we are refreshing the memory ten times less often, um, or one one tenth as often as as usual. Right, so for previously you'd have like in the same amount of time you'd previously have ten refreshes, and in the time that I will now have one. So um, yeah, like th this is already a huge performance uplift compared to the, the stock refresh interval. Um, also combined with the fact that the refresh cycle is a lot sh shorter than it is on auto. Um, anyway, then we have read to pre, which is a 12. You can push it lower, but it doesn't tend to do anything for performance and it can cause stability issues. Four active window is at 16. This one doesn't go any lower. Um, TCKE4, as in like that doesn't go any lower not because of stability like it is not supported for that to be lower than 16. Um, anyway CKE's at 4 which is also as low as that goes. DRAM write latencies at 32. Arguably that would probably work at 30 or maybe even 28 but I prefer just setting it to the same value as the cast latency because it takes out some of the the guesswork of is it stable or not. Um, and now we get to the tertiaries, which are actually a bit tighter than what I was running on the Maxima Z690 formula, just because with the formula, I wanted to quickly figure out if 4x16, you know, is like viable at all. And now that I know it's viable, it's like, well, where can we push it to? So, yeah, um, 11, 7. So these two are as low as it goes for the read to read same group and read to read different group. Like 11, 7 is, is as low as these go. Like you will... Well, maybe at lower memory speeds, you might be able to go lower, but at 6,000 to like 6,600... Actually, you can get away with 11.7 even at 7,000 sometimes. So at higher DDR5 memory speeds, 11.7 is as low as that goes. Um, and then once you start pushing past 7,000, you normally have to loosen out to like 12.7 or 12.8 even. Um, but yeah, in the 6,000 to sort of like 7,000 range, 11.7 works. Um, read to write same group and read to write different group are at 18. Uh, these might do 17 instead, but they like going from 18 to 17 doesn't change your performance. Um, or well, it does, but you're not going to notice. Uh, like you really won't, because that's like a what a five percent uh, change in like one specific memory operation. Anyway, right to right same group is at nine. This doesn't go any lower than nine. Um, I'm not sure if at lower speeds. I, the thing is, I just don't really run DDR5 at less than like 6,000 if I can help it because. The, the lower you clock your DDR5, the more it starts performing like DDR4, except with more memory latency, which is just like, that's bad, right? So, yeah. Um, so 9.7, this, like, for right to right, same group, different group, you're generally not going to be able to push these any lower than this. Um, then right to right, different, uh, I mean, right to read, same group, right to read, different group, we have f four, 56 and 46. There might still be a little bit of headroom in both of these, but this is generally as low as I'm able to run them uh, with this 12900K and these Corsair memory sticks. Now we get to the different rank and different dim timings. So for this memory setup, only one of these actually applies. Like I don't think, in theoretically, I should be able to punch in different rank four and it shouldn't cause any issues. But because I'm lazy and also because it's more aesthetically pleasing, uh, you know, 13, 13, 18, 18, like I have the different rank and different dim timing set to the same thing because that way I don't have to figure out if like, well, it should all like for this setup, it should always be different dim, but yeah, like setting it this way doesn't make a difference, right? And like the, like if you had dual rank dims, this will, setting the timings like this will work. If you have single rank dims and you have four of them, setting the timings like this also works. So that's, that's kind of that. Um, anyway, so 13, 13, 18, 18, uh, these two, so, well, the read to, uh, none of these will go any lower. If you set like the read to reads to 12, it won't run. 
If you set the read, uh, read to writes to 17, it won't run. If you set the write to writes to 12, it don't, it, it's not going to run. If you set the write to reads to 12, it's also not going to run. So these are as low as they're going to go. Um, and uh, yeah, but it also doesn't seem to call, like it doesn't cause any stability issues, which is really nice. Like these seem to be a really hard limit where it's like it either works or it doesn't. It, like... Yeah, like it's not even like you can go into the operating size system and set them to 12. That's actually how I know they don't work at 12 is because I would boot at 14 and then I'd lower it to 13 and it's like, oh, 13 seems to work just fine. And then you lower it to 12 and it instantly locks the system. So um, yeah, setting these any lower than 13, 13, 18, 18, like, does, like this is as low as these go for the different rank and different dim timings. Um, anyway, then TWR Pre is at 36. This is... In my experience with DDR5, basically as low as it's going to get, you can sometimes do 32. Sometimes. But it is very, like, 36 is very low for TWR Pre, and then also TWR PDEN is also at 36. Um, and then we have TXP at 4 and TPPD 0, which uh, these just improve your memory latency, and there's basically no stability. Like, I've never had these cause any stability issues, so I'm going to say that there's no stability penalty for them, or if there is a penalty, I'm not aware of it, because I've never seen it, so, yeah, um, anyway, um, that's it, that's, yeah, like, there's really not much to it, like, this is literally the exact same memory settings that I was running on the Maximus Z690 formula, except with tighter tertiary timings, same voltages, um, yeah, same everything, except for the tertiary timings, which are, like, and by the tertiary, well, yeah, the tertiary timings, which are slightly tighter than what I had on the formula. And so that's kind of that. Um, and yeah, I gotta say, like, I am very impressed that this works so well. I really didn't think, because, like, there are six-layer daisy chain motherboards that have, like, can have weird issues with just two sticks at 6,000 megabits per second. And then there's this board, which as far as I know, is a 6 star daisy chain. Runs 6,000 megabits per second on 4 by 16. You know, tertiaries as tight as they're gonna get. Um, secondaries, we could push them lower, but, like, at, like, it is hitting the limits of what the memory and the CPU can do. Like, I don't think the board is the limiting factor here. Um, speaking of the CPU being the limiting factor... The CPU is the main reason why we're not at 6,200 6, megabits per second, because at 6,200 megabits per second, the CPU cannot do even a single loop of LinPack. It will just error out on the first first loop of LinPack at 6,200 with this memory setup. So, um, and it doesn't matter what timings you're at. Like you could, you it can be suit like the the memory controller on this 12900K is trash, and I've said that many many times. And it's because it's true. It is trash. Like, it's just not going to do 6,200 megabits per second with this with this memory setup. So, yeah, that's that's it. Like, to my great surprise, even a, you know, I mean, the, the chip, like, the funny thing is a lot of people, you know, put an awful lot of weight on the chipset of a motherboard. Like, oh, it's a B660, therefore it's going to be worse than Z690. And it's like, the memory does not connect to the chipset. As far as the RAM is concerned, the chipset may as well not exist. The RAM connects to the CPU. And so the connection between the CPU and the RAM, that's the important part, and that has nothing to do with the chipset. So the fact that, like, like I'm surprised that a six-layer daisy chain board is doing this well with 4x16. What chipset it comes with isn't really relevant to that statement. Um, yeah, this is really cool. Um, and I would assume that Asus probably, like, based on my results with the formula and this board, I would dare say that pretty much any Asus motherboard that's on a, actually, I don't think you can get a four-layer DDR5 motherboard, so it save, saves you the trouble on that, but I would basically dare say that, like, any Asus, uh, DDR5 board should be capable of replicating these results. Um, or at least getting very close to them. Obviously, there's going to be some variance into, like, the CPU quality and that kind of thing, but, yeah, I'd be, I'd be surprised if I, you know, grabbed, like, a random DDR5 Asus board and it wasn't able to run these settings, considering, like, the formula runs them, this runs them. Admittedly, I don't have any other motherboards to check this on, but it's, like, motherboard vendors like to copy-paste their workaround, because if you've designed something once 
don't design it twice, right? So since they have this working on like two boards, I would assume they have this working on most boards, if not all of their boards. Um, and that's really cool because uh, four by 16 on a lot of motherboards doesn't work that great. Um, and when I say doesn't work that great, I mean, most of the time you'll get stuck at like 5,400 megabits per second, assuming you can even get to that. So yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm really impressed with this. Like it, it, it just works. And I really didn't expect that after my initial experiences with four by 16 DDR5. So yeah, thank you to Asus for providing the motherboard. Thank you for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. If you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon. There's a link to that down in the description below. Then there's also the HOC Teespring store where you can pick up shirts, hoodies, posters, you know, the usual YouTuber merch. And I also have a band camp. If like you hate your ears, you can like subject yourself to that. There's a link to that down in the description below as well. And that's it for the video, so thank you for watching, and goodbye!